Hello, this is your module on toxicology. Toxicology is the study of poisons. Exposure to toxins may be due to suicide attempt, accidental exposure, or occupational exposure on the job. 50% of poisoning cases in the medical environment are intentional suicide attempts. And I think you'll recognize quite a few of these as we move forward. 30% are from accidental exposure, for example, kids leaving things out, dogs licking up antifreeze. Uh, there's a lot of things like that. The remainder are a result of homicide or occupational exposure at work. Just like the last section that we did, there are different factors that affect the absorption of these toxic elements. The pH of the body, the rate of the dissolution through the body, your gastric motility, and the resistance to degradation in the GI tract. These are usually poisons, which are a substance that cause a harmful effect on exposure. There are a couple different types of toxicity we can get from this, acute versus chronic. Acute is fast and short term. Chronic would be repeatedly over a period of time. An example may be acute, a college student doing 21 shots on their 21st birthday. That's acute toxicity right there. Chronic would be something like somebody exposed to uh, a pesticide in a work environment over and over for a long period of time. So how do we analyze these toxic agents? Of course I have to throw some instrumentation at you guys here. There's usually a two-step procedure. The first one, a screening test, okay? We just want to see if there's any toxic elements present in their body. Usually rapid, simple, qualitative, meaning it'll give you a positive negative result. It's intended to um, specific substances or classes of intoxicants. So it may tell you that they're positive for opiates, but it won't tell you specifically that that opiate is morphine. It has good analytic sensitivity, but it's not specific. Things that we may use for screening are immunoassays, sometimes thin layer chromatography or gas chromatography. If the doctor knows that the opiates are positive, for example, in a patient's um, blood or urine, they may want a confirmatory test. Something that they may use is mass spectrometry. For example, if they do have positive opiates, is it um, heroin? Is it morphine? Is it oxycodone? There's many different things it could be, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. First one is alcohol. The general toxic um, effects of this are disorientation, confusion, euphoria, feeling wonderful, progressing to an eventual unconsciousness, paralysis, or even death. There's um, certain toxic effects involved with that. What happens is alcohol enters the normal glycolytic pathway, and then um, the end of the normal glycolytic pathway, we find acetaldehyde metabolite. So that's essentially what we're testing for, is that acetaldehyde metabolite. We find it associated with abuse of alcohol consumption or alcoholics. When someone drinks it, it's, they've got reduced judgment and motor performance, and chronic consumption over time can lead to alcoholic hepatitis or scarring of the liver, which is called cirrhosis. Another type of alcohol is methanol. This is a, top, a common type of solvent. You'll actually be using this in hematology to sick, fix blood cells onto a slide. But in the liver, Methanol is metabolized to alcohol dehydrogenase to form formaldehyde, okay? So if you drink this for fun, thinking it's gonna be like alcohol, it's actually gonna turn to formaldehyde inside your body. As you can imagine, that's not ideal, okay? Next one, isopropanol. This we call rubbing alcohol. This causes acute phase ethanol-like symptoms. So sometimes we find patients who um, are on, uh, are alcoholics that are trying to clean up or whatever, or you know, try to get over it, may have a binge and try drinking isopropyl alcohol because that's all they can find. And it may produce ethanol-like symptoms, but unfortunately, um, it, it's quite damaging. It's oxidized into acetone in the liver. So they actually smell like a combination of isopropyl alcohol or rubbing alcohol and nail polish remover. I remember, I'll never forget the day I had to go down to the emergency room and draw a patient who drank a couple bottles of this. The smell was burning my eyes because it was so strong of rubbing alcohol and nail polish remover coming at you. So it was crazy. The next one is kind of fun, ethylene glycol, which is a very common component of, hydro of hydraulic fluid and antifreeze. This can cause severe metabolic acidosis and renal tubular damage. 
What happens in the urine is calcium oxalate crystals form, and that can cause tubular damage inside the kidney. So what they do if somebody has taken this, now doggies, there's this cute little boxer down here looking up something that looks like antifreeze. Um, if they drink it, it to reverse the damaging effects of the calcium oxalate crystals, they give you an ethanol IV. So they give you, you know, they get you good and drunk for a few hours until it's eliminated from your system and that prevents the renal tubular damage from happening. We would on occasion get ethylene gly gly glycol um, lab samples on dogs because it tastes so good and it's, they're close to that garage floor and not really smart enough to know that they shouldn't eat it. The next one is carbon monoxide. This one is produced by the incomplete combustion of carbon containing substances. I think of um, every year during hunting season, I would say there's at least a few people in northern Wisconsin at their cabins that die of this because of some inefficient type of heat source they have in their cottage. And I know all of us um, that go to Rasmussen, we're all from Minnesota, North Dakota, Wisconsin. Um, so therefore we know someone who has a cottage. So that's that kind of always worries me. Um, it can also be caused from gasoline engines being improperly vented, um, furnaces, and wood or plastic fires. It's usually colorless and odorless, tasteless, and it's absorbed to the blood very quickly. Now usually hemoglobin in our blood carries oxygen, but it likes carbon monoxide more. So if it has carbon monoxide available, it has 200 times the binding affinity to carbon monoxide versus oxygen. So it'll essentially suffocate you from the inside out. Um, it decreases the amount of oxygen to the tissues produces hypoxia. We'll usually do some type of spectrophotometry or gas chromatography. We usually did these on our um, blood gas analyzers in the laboratories. Quite common actually, especially in the winter when furnaces go bad. Um, there's different types of caustic agents too, um, found in, um, you know, household products such as, you know, ammonia and um, if you ever mix ammonia and bleach together, it can cause pulmonary issues, etc. The next one is cyanide. This one can be found in industrial processes, in insecticides, rodenticides, um, produced by burning some plastics, and it can be a suicide agent as well. It's very toxic because it binds to heme iron, causes headaches, dizziness, respiratory depression, leading to seizure, coma, and death. Let's see if this next slide looks familiar. Did you ever hear of Auschwitz? the concentration camps in Germany. What they did with these prisoners is they were too weak to be good workers. They sent them to the gas changer, a chamber. They told them that they were going to be um, taking showers. But instead of taking a shower, um, these Zyklon B tablets, which are made from hydrogen cyanide, um, would create uh, the release of a poisonous gas from um, into the showers. So it would essentially kill all the people in the shower. So that was Hitler's way of annihilating those um, European Jews at the time. All right, next one, arsenic. We talked about that one um, with our trace elements and things like that. That is a non-essential, obviously. Found in rat poisoning, um, it can result in hemorrhagic gastroenteritis. So that will cause a lot of problems internally. Another one, which we may find um, problem with farmers and such, are pesticides. If you get exposed to too many insecticides, herbicides, pesticides, it can cause um, a lot of problems um, internally. You can inhale them, they can be absorbed through your skin, um, it can be occupational or accidental. It can lead to death as well. All right, let's talk about some of the toxicology of drugs that we may take. First one are salicylates. Salicylates are actually aspirin called acetylsalicylic acid. It's a very common analgesic, an antipyretic, which means it can decrease a fever, and an anti-inflammatory drug. It functions to decrease thromboxane and prostaglandin formation through the inhibition of cyclooxygenase. You don't have to memorize that, but it just sounds really cool to say. Um, some of the toxic effects when you take too much. Um, you can get metabolic acidosis, which can lead to death. You can also have respiratory alkalosis from hyperventilation if you have an initial overdose that um, it can just put you into that type of a fit. But eventually you could end up in a metabolic acidosis. We have inhibition of the Krebs cycle with this. 
um, resulting in the excess conversion of pyruvate to lactate, so they find a lot of lactic acid buildup. And we also see excess ketone body formation with severe overdose, which is um, where we get that acidosis from. The next one is acetaminophen, also known as your common Tylenol. This is a very common analgesic drug, but the overdose of this one causes severe hepatotoxicity. Um, from my days of working at a local hospital here, there was a patient who, um, God, he was about 17, and he came in with a um, acetaminophen level of 200. And normally if you take it for a headache, your level may be like five to 10. His was 200, so he took like a bottle of it. And he came in a couple days later. So you might take a bottle of it, and you'll be like, oh shoot, that didn't work. Okay, because he's obviously trying to kill himself or something. Nothing happens. Then all of a sudden you start getting liver issues, necrosis of the liver, etc., three to five days after ingestion. And unfortunately, the damage is irreversible. So this young fellow did end up on a liver transplant waiting list. So people that try to kill themselves by overdose, overdosing on acetaminophen actually just end up on a liver transplant waiting list, not very effective. We use um, immunoassay to uh, detect acetaminophen in the blood, and we can use high-performance liquid chromatography as well. Immunoassay is, works quite well though. Here's an example of um, that acetaminophen um, toxicity. So here if somebody takes the drug at zero hours, by four hours, okay, if they take a lot of it, um, it could be about, you know, up in this, you know, if it's in this range between these red lines, if it's above it, it's probably going to be toxic. So this guy, let's look at him. Um, he took probably a ton of it and he ended up in the probable hepatic toxicity range. Okay, so his was, you know, 200 and it was after a couple days. So he was definitely up in the probable toxicity area. Some other ways that we screen for drugs of abuse. Um, you can see this little screening test up top. We usually can screen for the, the most common categories of drugs. For example, is it opiates, is it amphetamines, etc. But it doesn't give us an exact drug, just a screen, okay? So you can see this one up here has one, two, three, four, five, six types of drugs, um, classifications. So that would be a screening method. We would then go and do um, a thin layer chromatography or mass spectrometry to confirm what type it is. Another type of drug would be amphetamines. Um, amphetamines, methamphetamines, crystal meth, um, those types of things. Uh, they, if in a therapeutic environment, they're used for narcolepsy and attention deficit disorder. But they are stimulants with a very high abuse potential. They produce an initial sense of increased mental and physical capacity and perception of well-being, so they make you feel fantastic. But then there's restlessness, irritability, and psychosis, which makes them want more to feel that, that high again. An overdose can be um, cause hypertension, cardiac issues, convulsions, and even death. With this, we do an aminoacid screening test on it. Like I said, we'll tell them exactly that they took amphetamines, so but we can't tell them exactly what kind. Another classification, anabolic steroids. Um, there's different classifications of these. I know a lot of people think of your bodybuilder, but um, there's other ones too, such as testosterone. Someone can just take testosterone. But anabolic are um, usually used to enhance um, some type of male sex hormone. It, it can increase muscle mass and improve, improve athletic performance. Um, we've had a lot of baseball athletes get busted with this lately. Some of the toxic effects if they take too much can be atherosclerosis, liver issues, um, abnormal platelet aggregations, a stroke, a heart attack, enlargement of the heart, cardiac um, problems. Here's some fun ones. Testicular atrophy, that's shrinking of the testicles. Sterility, impotence, which means you wouldn't be able to have babies. In females, we can see masculine traits, um, breast shrinkage and becoming sterile as well or not being able to have babies. The next classification are the cannabinoids. This is a group of psycho psychoactive compounds found in marijuana. It's commonly called tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, and that is usually what we test for in the human body. It's actually called THC-9-carboxylic acid. It produces a sense of well-being and euphoria, 
associated with impairment of short-term memory and intellectual function, and overdoses not associated with a um, physiologic toxic outcome. Usually it's hard to overdose on that one. We do um, an immunoassay with a gas chromatography mass spectrometry confirmation, just kind of like the rest of them. Cocaine. Cocaine is an effective local anesthetic with a few adverse side effects at therapeutic com concentrations. At higher concentrations, it's a potent central nervous system stimulator that gives a sense of excitement and euphoria. It's very highly abusive. Once people try it once or twice, they become very addicted. You can, um, it, you can take it through insufflation or IV um, injection or inhaled as a vapor or smoked as crack. Toxic effects, hypertension or high blood pressure, arrhythmia, seizure, or heart attack. We detect benzyl eganine in the urine by immunoassay. So we don't say, hey, there's cocaine in the urine. We detect benzyl eganine, which is the byproduct of that. We also use gas chromatography and mass spectrometry for, cons for uh, confirmation. Next one, opiates. These are a class um, capable of analgesia, sedation, and anesthesia. Okay, so when they put you under at the hospital, they would use a form of this. It's derived from the opium poppy, so if you ate extreme amounts of poppy seeds, you could potentially have um, opiates in your urine. Um, it would probably take a couple lemon poppy seed muffins for this to happen, I would think, if not more than that. Um, heroin is chemically modified form that turns into 6-acetylmorphine. Uh, toxic effects, respiratory acidosis, we find myoglobin in the urine, cardiac damage, and cardio cardiopulmonary failure. Here's the one where there's a lot of different drugs in this classification. Morphine, codeine, heroin, oxycodone, sometimes called oxycontin, hydrocodone, and methadone. The next one, PCP, fencyclidine. This one is an illicit drug with a stimulant, depressant, anesthetic, and hallucinogenic properties. So he's a multi-drug. Very high abusive potential. It can cause agitation, hostility, paranoia, and it can even cause stupor and coma as a toxic side effect. The next one are sedatives and hypnotics. Um, we can use these as tranquilizers or central nervous system depressants. Um, the barbiturates and benzodiazepines, a type of benzodiazepine is Valium, are the most common types abused. We find lethargy, with being tired, slurred speech, coma, respiratory depression, and a low blood pressure if you take too many of these. All right, sometimes when we do something such as illegal blood alcohol in the hospital, um, when I worked at a local hospital, we had to draw blood from the drunk drivers that the police officers brought in. We called it illegal blood alcohol. In that case, we had to sign a sheet and tape up a box and it became a chain of custody. So we had it, the police officer has it, it then goes to the um, health department or some in the, I don't know, in, our, in ours, it went to Madison. And they had a big lab that did all the legal blood alcohols. And then um, the tech that um, did the testing would sign it. So it's a chain of custody. Everybody that collected it, transferred it, and tested it has a signature on this form. And it's used in a legal environment. So sometimes we would actually have to go to court and they would ask us questions like, did you use an alcohol swab when you drew the, the patient? Did you... You know, they'd ask you all different types of questions um, to make, see if they could find any faults in the alcohol testing. So that's why they want to chain of custody on those. Here are some resources that I talked about um, in a, a couple sections ago. I talked about the quick review cards by um, Valerie Polanski, and you can see those down here. I'll go ahead and um, box that in for you. The quick science review cards for clinical laboratory science examinations. Um, this is a highly recommended purchase. I really like them because they're divided up into different sections and they can hole punch them and put a little uh, ring around it. And um, then they have one uh, section for each class that they're in. They run about $40 on Amazon. Um, usually they're not much differently priced, new or used, but something that you uh, might want to consider purchasing sometime in the future. I always tell my students to put it on their Christmas list. With that concludes our lecture on toxicology.